Okay. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the session on epilepsy and the last session from a PAC day. I'm Gail Farfell, and I'm the Chief Development Officer at Zogenix. To start us off, I'd like to bring up my co-chair, Neil DeCruz, who is a pediatric neurologist and epileptologist, uh, former CMO of Cyberonics, and now currently a consultant at large. And Neil's going to describe what's in store for you this afternoon in the epilepsy session. Neil? Thank you. Thanks, Gail. Um, all I can say is that you're in for a treat this afternoon. Uh, when, I, uh, put, when we put the symposium together, we thought since this is an ascent meeting, we'll use the principles of experimental neuroscience to set up the talks. So just as we do, we'll start with looking at the conceptual framework that we use when we think about planning treatments for disorders. And we look at correlations between what we think is the underlying reason for the disease and then correlate it with clinical expression, neuroradiological, neurophysiological, developmental aspects that then allow us to identify a certain set of metrics that we can use in designing, developing clinical trials and, and executing on the goal of obtaining new uh, therapeutics. So with that idea of the concepts, correlations, and clinical trials as the, as the principles, applying that to epilepsy becomes very interesting because the concept of epilepsy keeps changing. So if we are going to develop everything based on your original concepts and the concept keeps changing, then you get into an interesting situation where this book on the left, which is the physician perspective of concepts across time, summarizes how physicians have thought about epilepsy for the past two millennia. And when you look at interventions that are developed based on epilepsy being a disturbance in the force field, that looks very different than if you go over and think about the book that Ann Fadiman wrote, where it may be considered as a visitation of the force rather than a disturbance in the force field. And, what, and, and the reason that gets interesting is that interventions that are developed with one set of concepts may not reflect the preferences or priorities of the other group. And we have to consider that there may be opportunities left on the table without, if we don't take into account some of the priorities and preferences of the patients and the caregivers. So, as I said, the, the scientific community roughly changes its uh, perspective and concept of the disease roughly every 100 years. So at the end of the 19th century, after we finished treating epilepsy as a psychiatric disease, we decided that controlling seizures was the primary goal for treating epilepsy. And over the last 100 years, we've developed a number of treatments that target one or more aspects of the principal manifestation of the fits and falls that we call seizures, either changing the frequency through uh, most uh, drugs and, and diets, or altering the severity by, by interfering with the propagation of a seizure through open and closed loop systems, uh, looking at reducing the duration of the epilepsy through benzodiazepine, typically uh, benzodiazepine-based interventions, or treating comorbidities that are present with epilepsy, pain, mood, and sleep disorders that also show the network dysfunction that may be present in epilepsy. So how have we done over the last 100 years? Well, if we look at it today, we have our four Ds, our drugs, devices, diets, and drills, which is our surgical uh, outcomes. And roughly one out of three patients still continues to have seizures, especially if they are not surgical candidates. And we lose at least one patient an hour so that by this time tomorrow, 25 to 30 of our patients will be dead and the pattern will continue thereafter, which then means that our current paradigm of treating seizures is necessary but not sufficient to cover all the aspects of the disease that need to be uh, taken care of. So what would we do different in the 21st century based on the insights that we have from genetic screening, systems modeling, network mapping, and predictive analytics, things about which we now have information and data of how it relates to epilepsy, we could conceptualize that instead of treating the manifestations and the expression of the definition of epilepsy, enduring predisposition to seizures, instead of focusing on the seizures, we might look at figuring out where the enduring predisposition comes from and intervene in the process of epilepsy. And in order to do that, we have to then think about how we would design and develop clinical development plans that are scientifically valid from this concept, clinically relevant in a way that, that addresses patients' needs and preferences, 
operationally feasible, pharmacoeconomically viable, and an ethically acceptable design. So this is the acronym that we would use for thinking about a pragmatic way of conducting a clinical development plan, and that's what I call is it's in scope. So the reason you're in for a treat today is because we are going to look at how would epilepsy look if we thought about the concept of epilepsy as a network disorder. And Rod Scott is going to talk to us about how to apply complex systems theory and approaches in order to uh, have therapeutic gain, which will be then followed for some reason. This doesn't advance. Could you forward that for me, please? That will be followed by... That's my last slide. Well, there are four things on there. Let's go ahead and see if we can uh, introduce the topics as they come through. But I'll introduce the topics um, when, when the speakers get here. So Rod, would you set us off with the topic, outline, uh, applying complex systems approaches for therapeutic gain? Please help me welcome Rod Scott. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you today about an alternative way of constructing uh, epilepsy. Oh, I've got a blank slide. There you go. Let me go backwards. Uh, so what I'm going to try and do is show you that if we think about epilepsy as a complex system and apply complex systems ideas to epilepsy, then what we're able to generate is new ideas as to how we might go about treating it. So what I'll do briefly is describe what Neil's just described and say there's a therapy gap in epilepsy. I'll then define and describe a complex system for you and then develop this concept of a system level mechanism. And follow that up by saying, well, if we have a system level mechanism, is this something that's targetable and may we be able to improve outcomes by thinking in exactly those terms? So here is the therapeutic problem, and we've just heard about it. So approximately 30% of patients do not become seizure-free with current uh, approaches. And this is despite the introduction of multiple uh, anti-epileptic drugs. So we've gone from 10, maybe 10, to around about 30 drugs over the course of the last 20 years or so, and this number of 30% has largely stayed the same. And the multiple new AEDs have come through a variety of means, through serendipity, phenotypic screening, hypothesis-driven target-oriented design, structural modification of existing molecules, etc. If we think it's bad with seizures, then my particular interest is comorbidities, and this is far worse. So we have virtually no impact at all on the comorbidities, the cognitive and behavioral comorbidities associated with epilepsy. So the question now is, what do we do? So we could do more of the same, and I'll explain to you what I mean by that. Or we could try and reconstruct the idea, and that would be something different, and that's what I'm going to try and do for you today. So there are at least two scientific approaches and ways that we think about how we do science. The first one, reductionism, is really how biomedical science has progressed for hundreds of years. So this idea here is it's the practice of analyzing and describing a complex phenomenon, seizure, cognition, whatever you like, in terms of phenomena that represent a simpler or more fundamental level, especially when this is said to provide sufficient explanation. The mechanism of Dravet syndrome is NAV 1.1, a mutation in the SCN1A gene, for example. Um, standing up against that is the idea of complexity theory. So now instead of trying to take the complex system and break it down into unit parts, we say this is the study of complex and chaotic systems with large numbers of seemingly independent agents that can spontaneously order into a coherent system, and then to understand how order patterns and structures can arise from that and whether those patterns and structures are targetable mechanisms at the level of the system. So what do I mean by this? So if you ask somebody what a complex system is, they will show you something like this or flocks of birds. Uh, so what you have here is a termite mound. This termite mound is a beautiful, complex structure with enormous numbers of channels inside there that the, the termites are, are building, working in. This is an amazing structure. We know that this structure is dependent upon this thing, the termite. So now we're in a position of saying there's a relationship between a termite mound and a termite. Well, can we ask some questions about that relationship? So, yes, we can say, what caused the termite mound? This one is easy, and we can all agree on this unequivocally, the termite caused the termite mound. No termite, no termite mound. Let's ask it slightly more subtly. 
What is the mechanism of the termite mount? Now you, in a reductionist frame, would say, the mechanism of the termite mount is the termite. Therefore, I need to understand the termite in great detail. And you take the termite and you understand everything about the termite. If you do that, you will almost certainly not get to the point of understanding the termite mount. You'll simply get to the point of understanding the termite. So the issue here is the mechanism at the level of the system, so the system level mechanism, is a function of the network of interactions. It's how the termites are interacting with each other, how the termites interact with the soil, etc. So it's about the interactions. The fundamental principle here is it's about interaction. So let's think about it in biology. None of us are particularly interested in termites, I guess. So this is tuberous sclerosis. What's the cause of tuberous sclerosis? Mutation in a tuberous sclerosis gene. Okay, so I think we can all agree up to that point. The issue is when you look at outcomes of people with tuberous sclerosis, you get a huge variance. So you've got some people with epilepsy, some people without epilepsy, some people who are very cognitively impaired and have very, very difficult uh, cognitive problems, and you have people with IQs of 120. So it seems to me to be reasonable to say, what is the mechanism of this? We want patients who are destined to have a DQ of less than 10 to really end up being patients who have an IQ of 120. That would be ideal. So what are your potential ways of going about that? Well, the reductionist way says, I'm going to understand this. I know that the tuberous sclerosis gene is in the mTOR pathway. I'm going to understand absolutely everything about the mTOR pathway, and this leads to rapamycin, rapalogs, and sure, these things have had an impact on clinical practice, but they haven't solved the problem. The system's way of looking at it is this, saying somewhere inside here, somewhere inside this gene expression network is the tuberous sclerosis mutation. And a mutation in tuberous sclerosis influences many, many other things. So it doesn't only influence the mTOR pathway, it influences all of these other unmeasured things. So then the mechanism of the cognitive difference, the mechanism of the variance may be about somewhere else in the network that's not TS, or it may just be that the whole pattern is what's the mechanism. It's the pattern of gene expression that is the mechanism of outcome. So can you apply that idea to the idea of treatment? So here I'm going to use another analogy before I show you some data uh, on how things may uh, proceed over time. So let's imagine that this forest fire is an epileptic seizure. So in a reductionist view, you'd say forest fires have a cause. What's the cause? The cause is the match, and it's this particular brand of match. Okay, so epilepsy has a cause. It's the SCN1A mutation. Um, a reductionist view of that is if you want to fix it, you need to fix the match. But it not, might not be that brand of match. It might be this brand of match or this brand of match, or it might be glass or it might be a magnifying glass in the sun or whatever. The question then is how do you extend this to a system? So what you have is a system of the forest, which is dry, which is dry tinder, dry leaves, oxygen, and of course the match, and of course the spark and the heat. So you can either take a reductionist view and go after the match, or of course you could go after the systems view and say, if I can make the forest look like this, then this forest is not going to catch fire in irrespective of what type of match you want to lay at it. So that's the idea of a system level treatment. So then let's define a complex system. This is any system featuring large numbers of interacting components. For us, that would be genes, proteins, neurons, etc., whose aggregate activity is nonlinear. So you can't just add up every gene and get expression of epilepsy or whatever else. And typically exhibits hierarchical self-organization under selective pressures. This is a more difficult construct. This is the idea that there are local rules and local interactions are the things that ultimately build up to the emergence. So there is no single gene which is the controlling gene of the genome. There's no single protein which is the controlling protein of the proteome. So let's move into the brain then. So the brain is probably the most complex system that we know. And when that system is disrupted, people get epilepsy. So here you have a well-tuned, well-organized, complex system where you've got a network of genes which are nonlinearly related to a, a network of proteins which are nonlinearly related to a protein of a network of synapses, etc. And what you get at the end of all of these self-organizations is a phenotype. You get an emergence of epilepsy, an emergence of cognitive impairment, an emergence of something else. Of course, you also get feedback. So if you have a seizure, then you would expect CFOS to 
be expressed, and if CFOS is expressed, then this is going to change transcription factors, which is going to alter everything else. So breaking the system at any one of these points, genetic mutation, something wrong with the protein, hitting the brain and breaking a synapse, however you want to disrupt the system, this thing will retune and the emergent phenomena will be different. The trick then is to say, how do we tune it back? How do we turn this back into a complex system that works? And I'm going to show you at the level of the genome, at the level of the microcircuit, and the level of the brain, how that might be possible. So let's think about identifying targets using uh, systems genetics. So this is a paper from Michael Johnson where they took humans with temporal lobe epilepsy, did gene expression arrays on the, um, on the hippocampi that were extracted from the humans, identified genetic modules, and then within this genetic module, module one, they identified a protein called cestrin 3 which seemed to be an important uh, protein with respect to predicting the seizure outcome. Uh, this protein happens to be inside this module, which is an inflammatory module. They did the same thing in mice exposed to pilocarpine, found cestrin 3 They knocked out cestrin 3 in zebrafish and gave them picrotoxin, and the, the fish had far fewer seizures. Cestrin 3 was never on anybody's radar. There was no way that cestrin 3 was coming out of a traditional genetics approach. You needed to look at the whole genetic system in order to find it. So what about the whole pattern? That says you look in the system and you find a piece of it. Is there a way of saying, well, the whole system is broken, can we manipulate it? And the answer is yes. Um, so here's the idea of identifying new anti-epileptic drugs through genomics-based repurposing. So here you need two requirements. Here you have a gene expression profile from hippocampi of patients with mesial temporal sclerosis. We know that you can get those. And there are libraries of drug effects on gene expression profiles of immortalized cell lines. So there's thousands of drugs that have been put onto immortalized cell lines and gene expression data has been taken out. So we know what a gene does to, the gen uh, what a drug does to the genetic system. What you then do is find a drug out of the library which is anti-correlated with the gene expression profile of the disease. So upregulated genes become downregulated, and downregulated genes would be upregulated. And this identified cytogliptin, an anti-diabetic medication, as a repurposing candidate. And in fact, now in two different labs, in vivo testing in mouse models of pharmacoresistant epilepsy shows that cytogliptin is in fact anti-epileptic. Again, this is not something that would have been, a, been thought of outside of the context of uh, complex systems. Okay, so I'll quickly go through neural dynamics. So the idea here is that behavior and cognition are a function of dynamic activities of action potential firing within neural networks. I can speak to you, I can do this, I can wave my arms around because action potentials are firing, not because genes are being expressed. So the localization and patterns of the dynamic behavior is the system level mechanism of behavior and cognition. So the idea is that you can measure pyramidal cell activity and we can do this in single units. Greg Holmes will show you how this happens in the next talk. But the function of these things is a function of the entire network. Uh, you can stimulate medial septum and drive hippocampal firing in a way that improves outcome, but this is entirely non-mechanistic. What we wanted to understand was whether there was a system level mechanism. So now we record single units, uh, action potentials from multiple cells recorded simultaneously in a model of malformation of cortical development that we uh, get environmentally enriched. Okay. So what you can do is measure patterns of those cell firing activities. And we know from a lot of work that, for example, cells that um, fire in particular places in an environment, place cells that have high fidelity also predict good spatial cognition. And in fact, what you find is the MAM cells are less, less high fidelity and when you're environmentally enriched, this network is able to recover and you get high fidelity cells and these animals are smarter. This would be a very difficult therapeutic target. However, what you also find is when these cells fire, they fire in bursts. So they have modulation in time. So what you can see here is that the modulation in time in the MAM animal is worse and the modulation in time is improved with enrichment. Okay. What's exciting for me is there's a direct relationship between these two things. This implies that if you can stimulate, if you can drive this state of modulation, if you can make this improve, then chances are you will improve cognition via improvement in place cells. 
And this is exactly what we would propose to do. You stimulate the medial septum. We know it enters this complex hippocampal system. You measure something. You take that measurement. You retune until you find the thing here that you think is the right thing. And you can do that. So if you take a pilocarpine animal and you stimulate them uh, across a range of frequencies and you predict what their spatial coherence would be like, what you find is you get a tuning curve. And if you, this would argue that if you stimulate it at 7 hertz, you'd get a good outcome. And if you stimulate it at 5 hertz, you'd get a bad outcome. And indeed, what these two heat maps are showing you is if you stimulate at 7 hertz, these colors here are the theta modulation, and they're not there at 5 hertz. And you can see here in a way that's quantified. So I would argue that this is just as personalized medicine as gene therapy would be. This is personalized to the individual's neural network. And here's my last slide to discuss what you might do at the level of the whole brain. So the virtual brain is a construct that's coming out of France. The idea is you take individual patient data, you take their EEG data and their MRI data, and you model them in a way that gives you information in silico. So what you then have is a network, an in silico network um, of interactions between various parts of the brain. What you can then do, whoops, I did not just miss that, so it stops making noise. What you can then do is do an in silico operation. So if you think the seizure focus is here, then you can take out these nodes, let this thing evolve in time, and work out whether the pattern that are now arises is a pattern that doesn't have epilepsy. And if you take out a different node, is it a pattern that does show seizures? Can you then in silico define where the right operation is and guide the surgeon? Again, this requires networking information, complex theory, uh, complex systems thinking in order to be able to do this. So I hope in my brief period of time, I've been able to convince you that complex systems are a legitimate approach to understanding epilepsies and generate this idea of a system level mechanism. This is not hand wavy. This is just as rigorous science as reductionist science. It should be conceptualized in the same way as you conceptualize reductionist science. Abnormal networks at multiple hierarchical levels of a complex systems are modifiable, and that modification impacts behavior. And what I haven't spoken to you about is the, the tools. There are many tools that are now emerging very rapidly for us to capture these ideas and be able to influence uh, the systems using these tools. And I think that's it, so thank you very much. Thanks, Rod, for that quick and comprehensive review of concepts. Um, our next speaker needs no introduction, especially not to the epilepsy community. Uh, Greg Holmes is going to talk to us about does age matter, pathophysiological substrate of focal and generalized uh, seizures during development, and he will talk about the various ways that the developing nervous system and the maturational aspects interact. Um, Greg? I'd like to thank Neil and Gail for inviting me, and it's also great to be on a panel with Martina and Rod and have three pediatric neurologists here today, so I'm glad to be here. So I'd like to, these are my disclosures. And so does age matter? Well, I, I think age certainly does matter when we're talking about seizures and we're talking about seizures in children. And, you know, many anti-epileptic drugs are uh, tested initially in adolescents and adults. Once, improved, once approved, it's very difficult logistically and ethically to do similar studies in children, raising the idea whether such studies are necessary, whether data can be extrapolated from adults to children. And really to understand and to, to, to argue that extrapolation can be done, you have to demonstrate that there's some disease similarity across uh, ages. And I want to kind of go through some of the biological reasons why we think uh, and what we do, and the, the bottom line is going to be by age two, most children act, their seizures are very similar to what you see uh, in adult patients and adolescent patients. And it is a challenge. The brain is uh, developing, um, you know, prenatally and even postnatally, there's a lot going on as far as uh, development that's occurring, synaptogenesis, competitive elimination of synapses, myelination continues, programmed cell death continues. So you're really looking at a moving target when you talk about the, the developing brain and what uh, seizures, um, how seizures would be emanating from such a uh, evolving uh, structure. So we break down seizures into two major categories. We have partial onset seizures, and I really like not a, people, a lot of people may not know how to read, not be familiar with EEG here, but here's a partial seizure, and what you can see here is in this temporal lobe. 
Uh, here you can see this nice rhythmic discharge, which is confined to the right temporal lobe. You do not see it in other areas. Compared to a generalized seizure, where very suddenly in all channels you see generalized spike in wave activity. And so that'd be uh, generalized. Now some partial onset seizures will become secondarily generalized, but there you're concerned about the partial onset, not the generalization. So what is the basis for uh, partial onset seizures? And it is, does this occur in the very young brain? So I think we can think of the um, partial, the physiological basis is the proxismal depolarization shift here. What you have here is a, a surface EEG recording and what we see on, on patients with seizures often have interictal spikes on their EEG and here the patient's having a bunch of interictal spikes rhythmically and this is an actual uh, seizure. If you then move down to the intracellular level, the hallmark for the interictal spike is what's called a proxismal depolarization shift. Major excitation, excitatory postsynaptic potential is a very large one, which leads to depolarization, which leads to uh, action potentials. And most of the time, if you have spikes, you have some rebound uh, uh, hyperpolarization or inhibition, and so you do not have a seizure. But Sometimes the biologic milieu in the brain will change and so that this proxismal depolarization will not hyperpolarize and you'll go ahead and have an actual uh, tonic uh, a seizure. We know that interictal spikes occur in baby rats. We know they occur in babies. And we know that the proxismal depolarization shift can be identified. Uh, and uh, Mark Dichter did work like this many years ago. It can be identified in uh, baby um, uh, rats and rodents. So the basis for partial onset seizures occurs very early uh, in the developing uh, brain. Uh, now, if you look to generalized seizures, you have to think more of circuits when you think of generalized seizures. You have to think about the thalamus the, uh, uh, and the nucleus reticularis thalami, the NRT. And these are interconnecting structures, and all of a sudden these will change from regular burst firing to where they will change into a pathological firing where you have generalized a spike in wave activity. So again, you have these three structures here. And sort of what drives this system are what are called these uh, low uh, threshold transient calcium channels. And these result in burst firing. And what's really interesting about these channels is they fire, they open up when the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, cell is hyperpolarized. And the hyperpolarization is due to uh, GABA. So you have, um, and you go along here, all of a sudden you see this hyperpolarization. Uh, this leads to opening of these transient calcium channels. And you have this burst firing, hyperpolarization, burst firing, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this will lead on the surface EEG to generalized spike and wave. And drugs have been targeted for epsilon seizure, really uh, t targeting like uh, transient calcium channels, drugs like uh, ethosuximide. Uh, and certainly GABA drugs can be helpful in uh, primary generalized uh, seizures. Okay, so that's the, the basis for the um, a seizure. So this is like the match uh, that uh, Dr. Scott was telling you about. So that exists in babies and exists in baby rats, but whether this proxismal depolarization shift occurs, whether the thalamocortical uh, system moves into aberrant activity, really depends upon the biological mule of the developing brain. So if you're gonna to try to extrapolate, you have to really understand the force that Dr. Scott talked about as opposed to just the match. So we know that the baby brains can have the ability to do the proximal depolarization shift, and develop this aberrant circuitry, but do they? And what is the underlying basis? And really the underlying basis um, for whether the seizures occur or not is the excitatory inhibitory balance. And uh, there's a lot of ways to look at that. I say I think sort of the hot topic is looking at GABA, which we all know is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter of the brain. Uh, it um, uh, is uh, important uh, in inhibition, uh, but uh, GABA is an unusual. The the, uh, the channels are uh, unusual. GABA receptors are unusual in that you can reverse current, and in baby uh, neurons, GABA can be actually be excitatory as opposed to inhibitory. Now, GABA is important not only in inhibition, but it's also uh, very important in the development of uh, oscillatory activity. And that's because these uh, GABA interneurons will innervate many pyramidal cells at one time. When they fire, you tend to get this burst firing here. So GABA is important in synchronization of the brain, is also important in uh, general excitability.
and the EI balance. And if you look at baby cells, um, they have, due to transporter uh, differences in maturation, they have increased cl intercellular chloride. And so when GABA hits a baby neuron, um, the chloride high concentrations will leave, will efflux out of the uh, cell, and this will actually lead to depolarization and excitation. So uh, you're depolarizing these cells. So these cells are uh, hyper-excitable as opposed to an, um, um, uh, inhibitory. And you can imagine if you had a drug like phenobarbital, which is a GABA drug, uh, clonazepam, GABA drugs, you could actually make the situation worse because you'd be blocking the GABA receptor. So that's why we, you just you have to be very careful in extrapolating drugs to uh, babies because you know if this system is really robust, uh, this could be a drug that could make seizures, uh, stop seizures in adults would actually lead to seizures in increasing in, in uh, baby neurons. So this is an important part of that biologic milieu I've been uh, talking about. So the, the good news though is that GABA excitatory inhibitory, that switches very early in life. And you can look at rats and we can look at preterm uh, uh, primates. And uh, so the GABA being excited or inhibitory is certainly a very early event. You can look at the development of AMPA and NMDA, uh, excitatory um, receptors, and also your, you know, your physiological development of ion channels, your sodium channel, your potassium channels. But the bottom line here is all these immature features, they're, they're done the first year of life, and certainly by two years of life, uh, this is all similar to what you see in the older animal. Even brain growth, which I'll talk about in a second, is really peaks uh, during the first uh, year of life and by P21, which refers to postnatal day when we talk about rats. Of course, myelination continues. So that's sort of the uh, substrate. So um, this forest that uh, Dr. Scott talked about, how does one build this forest? And I would agree with him totally to really understand seizures, seizure propagation. You really have to understand the network of the brain uh, to really get a feel for how these seizures are developing uh, and the consequences of the seizures. And also, as he noted, some ways that you may be, in, be able to intervene on the circuit level to um, uh, prevent uh, um, uh, epilepsy. So let's look briefly at the network uh, development of serving seizures. We do know that morphologically, the brain is pretty mature at age two. All the major brain structures are in place. There's certainly gonna be continued um, sprouting of fibers and dendritic growth, et cetera. But uh, uh, everything that should be there is, is there. And by two years of age, the human brain is over 80% of its maximum brain weight. And synaptogenesis is pretty much hit its peak, uh, and most of the targets are myelinated, although this will continue. Well, that's fine about morphology, but if you're going to understand the network, as Dr. Scott mentioned, you're going to have to really understand the physiology and how cells talk to one another and the, the, how the brain is connected uh, uh, from one area to the other. And he already talked a little bit about how you can look on the... Um, uh, uh, micro level, uh, looking at single units, which that refers to action potentials of cells. Uh, you can look at uh, intracranial uh, EEG. You can start looking at surface uh, EEG. So your degree of sophistication, uh, degree of going from micro to macro ends up with you looking at the um, surface uh, EEG here. And this allows us to then uh, take these, these oscillations inform relationships, look at phase coherence, how well, how well the phases are together, amplitude correlations. to tell you a little bit about brain connectivity and how this network is really developing. The, this is, we're gonna look at the entorhinal cortex, hippocampal network, because this is pretty important. Uh, and, uh, and, and seizures, or do we, he talked already about mesial temporal sclerosis. But I'd just like to look at about the cell development, how this system matures, and what that can tell us about the network uh, as a whole. So the entorhinal cortex feeds into the uh, hippocampus, um, uh, several pathways into CA1 and the dentate uh, here. And one can record single cells to get a um, uh, better look at what's going on from a physiological standpoint. And you can um, uh, cluster these cells and look at individual neurons in the cells they're firing. One cell uh, he mentioned already that's good to look at are called the place cells, and these are cells that fire in certain locations in space. You put this rat in this uh, arena here, 
you have a cue card here, and here's a cell that fires. This is a heat map showing a firing rate here. These are tetrodes, four wires, and you can look at the action potentials. And you can say this cell fires at 5 o'clock, this cell fires at 12 o'clock, and this cell fires everywhere, and that's an inner neuron, a very fast spiking uh, cell. So these are place cells that are stable. Uh, and you bring the rat back the next day, uh, and if the, the cue card remains in the same place, the same cell will fire in the same location. These cells will also, uh, if you put the rat on a linear track here, um, uh, here you can just look at each one of these individual cells. Here we're looking at exit potentials. As the animal runs down the track, these cells fire, uh, and they're put in sequence here. Uh, and when the rat stops um, uh, running, uh, you have a sharp wave ripple here, and these cells fire again, but in a much shorter time span than when they're running down the track. And this is called replay. And it's felt that this leads to some long-term potentiation and helps for memory consolidation. And if you have a rat in the daytime running around, he runs through these place cells, you get these different clusters here of different place cells firing, and then you put the rat to sleep, and lo and behold, the same thing happens. They have a sharp wave ripple, and the place cells fire again, again, much more rapidly than they did when the animal was just running around in space. So we have the place cells, which are important for location, and then we have also called grid cells that are in the entorhinal cortex that fire in a grid pattern as opposed to a uh, single place field. And the grid cells feed on to the place cells. So there's, there's uh, the flow from information from the entorhinal cortex to the hippocampus. Here's a place cell, here's a grid cell, and here's the direction of information flow. So these cells are all developing in a very specific, specific order. Important cells for understanding the development of the hippocampus and how memory is formed. And indeed, this work led to the Nobel Prize in 2014 by John O'Keefe for play cells in the Mosers for their work on grid cells. So developmentally, how does this work? Well, you found that the first cells that kind of develop are these boundary cells that fire when the animal's at the, at the edge of a container. This is followed by place, uh, grid cells, which feed into place cells, and, uh, and we mentioned the sharp wave ripples that occur here. Uh, Dr. Scott mentioned to you that these place cells, this is called rate coding, but these cells are very, they fire also in relationship to brain rhythms. And uh, mainly the, the theta rhythm is very important, but also gamma rhythms are important as to the timing of when these place cells will fire. So this whole network is, develops in a sequential fashion and is pretty intact by the time the animal is in the second and third week of life. So uh, one would conclude that the, based on um, morphological data, based on physiological data, a two-week-old rat is similar to a two-year-old child, and a two-year-old child's brain is pretty similar to a 16-year-old child's brain in, in many regards. Brain size, EI balance, synaptic density, physiology, uh, spatial cognition and EEG are pretty, pretty similar um, here. So that's the system developing uh, and uh, understanding that's important for understanding how seizures develop and spread. But it also raises points about what happens when seizures occur before this development occurs or while this development is occurring. And we used a, a hyperthermic model. This is work with Tally Barham in which she leads to hyperthermic um, seizures in these rats, so similar to febrile seizures, time similar to what we see in febrile seizures in children. And if you look at these animals later in life, the majority of them have seizures. And if you look at them cognitively, you'll see that play cells um, are very dispersed compared to your control animals, particularly in animals that have had febrile seizures and have MRI changes, which I won't go into now. And, and these animals in a Morris water maze do very poorly based on, the, and this is a spatial task um, there. So if you perturb the system with febrile seizures before or during the um, uh, febrile, um, during, during development, you can lead to, to harm. So we found that in this model, you can get dendritic pruning uh, following prolonged febrile seizures. You can actually image this pruning. And this is just evidence that there are system problems that occur following these febrile seizures uh, that involve multiple areas of the brain. You have to look at the brain as a network, not just single brain, brain areas. And these st structural changes correlate very well with uh, physiological changes that we see in gamma rhythms, 
both slow and fast uh, in the gamma. So the physiology follows the um, uh, structural uh, changes, which follows the cognitive impairment. So can you do anything about that on a system level? Well, we did work with uh, Tally, in which we uh, looked at the neuronal um, uh, uh, restrictive silencing factor, and this is a factor that silenced a number of genes. And, um, uh, and, what, we, and uh, what we found is that if you block these uh, NRSF expression, blocking with the uh, NRSC uh, ODNs here, you can actually block the uh, NRSC element here with binding to the NRSF, and this will prevent this downregulation of genes. And when you do that, you see a nice reversal of cognitive impairment, uh, and you see a reduction in seizures these animals have. So this gives you an intervention after the fact that you can use to try to prevent seizure-induced uh, damage and also prevent uh, epileptogenesis from occurring. So our take-home message here is that there are rapid changes in the structure and function of the brain during the first two years of life. Understanding the development of neural circuits is critical to developing strategies to prevent seizures and seizures associated with comorbidities. By age two years, uh, key biological features responsible for seizure onset and propagation are similar to adults for both partial onset and generalized seizures. And whereas normal activity patterns are required for circuit maturation, aberrant neuronal activity during development can have major adverse consequences, such as uh, disrupting the development of memory. So thank you very much. So that second take home message is what leads us to the third talk, uh, which is understanding the development of neural networks is critical to develop strategies to prevent seizures and seizure associated comorbidities. So when I heard about the PREVENT trial that Martina leads, I said, you're gonna do a prevention trial in epilepsy? And she said, yes, and we are using EEGs. So I'm eager to hear about the, the first and largest trial that is uh, being conducted uh, with prevention trials using the role of EEG as a biomarker in patients with tuberous sclerosis. Please help me welcome Martina. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the organizers for inviting me. And what I'm gonna to talk to you is really putting a lot of these concepts um, into clinical practice and where we are um, currently in this prevention trial that's underway. Um, we chose tuberous sclerosis, and this is an area of research for me, because it's one of the ideal models to look at prevention trials, and the feasibility is um, probably better than most um, genetic conditions because we know that almost half of the patients have cardiac rhabdomyomas that can be diagnosed prenatally and often um, have cardiac arrhythmias in the nursery, and that's how they're identified. And because of the advances in prenatal ultrasound, um, about two-thirds of patients are now diagnosed prenatally before they're born. Um, and you can see from this illustration that you can have the cardiac rhabdomyomas um, as evident here, as well as the subependual nodules. And you can also see the cortical tubers on fetal MRIs. And we've seen evidence of that as young as 27, um, 28 weeks gestation. One of the biggest hurdles we have is the communication between the perinatologist, and neonatologist, and the neurologist, because typically the clinical practice is you don't call a neurologist till they have the first seizure. So we've had to do some major efforts in really having this crosstalk and collaboration that as a neurologist, and most neurologists run tuberous sclerosis clinics, is that we're seeing before these babies are born in part of the conversation with the families um, from the very beginning, and this is what really is the feasibility to do prevention trials. Um, the other thing is, is um, the early recognition of seizures is imperative for families, and I think this has been an education process for me, having worked really specifically in this area for about six to seven years, is what we originally thought um, was going on is evolving and changing constantly, and we're seeing most of the children well, well before they even have infantile spasms. So there's a whole array of very subtle seizures that we're now recognizing, and it's our job, too, to um, teach the families and have them access to a neurologist so they know who to call. We also do an EEG at the time of the initial diagnosis, and this has become one of the recommendations in the practice parameters um, for TS, 
and is um, fairly well adopted now and is actually being paid by insurance companies, which is amazing. Um, but, you know, it's very fortunate. So this is, carries on the theme of the previous speakers, where in TS you have the TS mutation, and it's really in the pre-epileptogenic time window that we were very interested in what's going on in this latent period. And during this time, we then begin to see the emergence of epileptiform activity. So for a lot of us that work in this field, it's kind of the holy grail is could we ever get on the prevention side of this? Um, and then what was, is there a window of time between the epileptiform activity and the first clinical seizure? And then we all know that if the seizures aren't controlled, you're then looking at refractory epilepsy, you have cognitive impairment, and you have de delays in their development. So with this idea in mind, and I was thinking um, when I came here and preparing this talk, the TS model is really applicable to many other genetic um, conditions which there's a high risk for, for epilepsy, and these are just three that I thought of, and then you have all the channelopathies. Um, and also it can be applied if you think about a tra traumatic brain injury where there's often a window of time before the patient starts having seizures. So this whole concept can be applied in, in many areas. Um, so when we originally did this, it was, we first had to lay the groundwork. What was the natural history and the evolution of what happens in, to TS babies in the first year of life? Because two-thirds of them develop their seizures in the first year, um, about 85% of them by the age of two. So we knew that was their highest risk, but we didn't really understand what were the windows when things happened and when the seizures are likely um, to begin. So this was the original interim paper before we started the PREVENT, and this is the um, final analysis of that that's been submitted for publication. And there were 40 babies which we followed um, and recruited over a 14-month period of time. So this is just watching and serially doing EEGs and watching the natural um, evolution of their epilepsy. Um, we didn't have any restrictions on treatment, so six were pretreated with Vigabatrin. Um, and that kind of goes with the original publication from Dr. Joswiak in Poland that there was benefit from pretreatment. I will tell you as a caveat that five of these six patients went on to have seizures. Only one remained seizure free. 32 of the infants um, went on to have the final analysis and we really looked at what was the marker of the first epileptiform change on the EEG and then critically, what's the time window before they had their first seizure? Because if we had a window, then that really led the opening for doing a preventative trial. Also, the other thing were what were the seizure types that we were seeing, um, which was um, also very important. So this um, table summarizes kind of what we found. Is the eight, first age on average of when the epileptiform activity um, occurs is about four and a half months. The first clinical seizure is about seven and a half months. So there's a window of time between three and a half and four months that you have the opportunity to intervene. When we looked at um, terms of the true positives and false positives, the vast majority were true positives. What's interesting in these five that were um, false positives, they all had four of the five had their first EG and they were well under two months of age was abnormal and then their subsequent serial EGs were normal. So we saw it once and we didn't see it again. The, fit, the fifth one had the abnormality develop in the second year. So they really had moved out of that first year high risk window. Um, we had three that were um, false negatives, meaning we probably, because this, the EGs were done every six weeks, we probably missed the window when their EG was normal by the time they came back. They, it, it had converted and they were already having seizures and then seven were true negatives. You can see that the positive predictive value, so though that meaning that if you had an abnormal EEG, you were gonna go on to have clinical seizures is fairly high at 77%. So based on this information, we were um, able to conclude that you can identify um, a biomarker for EEG, and I was really um, felt very strongly that we should try to do this using routine data acquisition on a one-hour study that could be applied you know, at any hospital and try to include at least 20 minutes of sleep. And as I mentioned, the average time was about three to four months. Um, and then the epileptiform activity was really just a focal or multifocal spikes or sharp waves. Um, only two um, infants of the several hundred EEGs that were done in this whole study ended up having a modified hips arrhythmia. So really having a modified hips arrhythmia or hips arrhythmia is a very, very late consequence of this epileptogenesis 
And that's another thing, because we're working earlier and earlier in this population, we're seeing things that we probably didn't know were, what was going on because we weren't looking. So it's really changed our mindset. The other thing is, is that it really was um, broke down to thirds. A third had partial seizures, a third had a combination of partial seizures and spasms, and a third had spasms alone. So this led into our ability to have NIH fund, both funded the biomarker study and then funded the PREVENT study, which is in its third year. Our hope is that we will finish enrolling um, late um, this summer, early fall. And there are now 14 sites across the country. It's a phase 2B study. And the primary objective is to really look at the developmental impact early versus delayed treatment with vigabatrin and really look at a very comprehensive developmental assessment at um, two and three years of age, and it also includes autism testing. Um, we picked Vigabatrin because it was quite a negotiation with the FDA to go from the treatment um, of epilepsy to a preventative treatment with a um, medication, and we knew Vigabatrin was approved for this population, in particular for this kind of diagnosis. So it was a much easier step to begin with this drug. The other um, objectives is really to look at whether the use of preventative treatment with vigabatrin um, prevents, delays, or ameliorates the seizures, and we don't know that yet. And then you can see the extensive developmental assessments that we're also incorporating into this. Um, and then we'll get more information on the safety of vigabatrin used as a preventative therapy and also more data on the feasibility of using EEG as a biomarker. This is just a study design. It's a um, power of 80. Um, you have to be between birth and six months of age. We enrolled children down to 32 weeks gestation. Um, they cannot have received any other type of therapy, including an mTOR inhibitor, um, uh, ketogenic diet, um, exposure to CBD, and this has come up um, with some of the mothers being on an mTOR inhibitor during the pregnancy. Um, we recently had a situation where the mother um, smoked marijuana during pregnancy and they checked for CBD in the cord blood and it was present. So we've been very careful and very stringent to avoid any of those factors that could potentially influence our primary outcomes. In the first year, the EEGs are done every six weeks, and then the second year every three months, and then um, once a year after that. They're, if they are randomized, you can see um, it's an interesting study because its design is really timed to, for seizure, and um, the way we had to understand how many people would end up being randomized, and the rule of thumb is it's really two-thirds end up going on to have seizures when you have all comers and one-third don't, so it's a watchful waiting kind of um, monitoring, and the vast majority of children that have um, epilepsy in TSC have TSC2 mutations. So we have genetics on all of these patients as well. One of the key things was the hurdles was doing the EEG. When we did the original biomarker study, it would take up to 12 hours to data transfer to the server at UCLA. With this, we're using the cloud. We can um, upload the data without video in under an hour. We have readers on both coasts, one in Boston and one at Stanford, who give you real-time results. An email is sent to the principal investigator, and a decision is made whether you randomize a, the child or not. So getting over those hurdles logistically was a big deal and made this um, totally feasible once we were able to do that. Um, this is another big issue, and I think I've appreciated this more and more, is the EEG inter-rater reliability. And critically important. It was stressed by our NIH DSMB, and I'm very grateful for that, in that we have three um, readers. Two, all three um, are blinded. There's two that are a primary reader. Um, they are blinded when they read them, and they were selected because I used um, a sample set of EEGs from the previous study that they read, and they were scored for their reliability, and they had the highest, they matched the highest, and it was 0.88. So they were selected as reader um, B and C, and then we have an adjudicator who will split the difference if there's a disagreement. And what you can see is what really, um, the two critical pieces are the interictal discharges and the location, that this is a recent, we reanalyze this like every four months, and they've really maintained that high degree of inter-rater reliability. 
The other thing is, is you have to try to minimize bias as much as possible because then there's a local read it done at each site. And I, I'm very fascinated to look at the local readers many times read these abnormal. And so it's so important to have the consistency and the knowledge base of these um, readers because they've been doing this for five years and are very consistent. And I think that's strongly influenced and strengthens our results when the time comes. Um, so lessons learned. Um, really the importance of identifying the longitudinal changes of the EEG, which we would not have been able to do the PREVENT study without doing the P20 pilot, which NIH funded, and really having a, quote, normative data set. Also the standardization of the EEGs, everybody has to do it the same way. It's very tightly um, controlled and there's um, quality control done periodically. Also, as I mentioned, the importance of your central readers and their inner rate of reliability. Um, because that's really the strength of the study. If that falls or drifts, then you're going to have problems in your analysis. Um, this would not have been uh, um, possible without tremendous commitment um, from the EEG readers and then the 14 sites that are involved in this. Um, it's going to be a while before we have the final results, but I think using this model and knowing that you can do this really opens the door to all kinds of possibilities to be on the preventative side of epilepsy. Thanks. Thank you, Martina. Uh, we'll have a panel discussion for questions and answers. So um, while people come up, try and use the, uh, the uh, mics at the front of the room. I think that's got better audio. Uh, I had a question to start off for each of the panelists based on the, on the topic that you presented. What do you see today as being our challenge and an opportunity? Uh, is this working? Uh, so I think I said it in my talk, actually. I think the challenge is trying to identify novel targets, and the opportunity is using an alternative way of thinking about the problem to do that. Um, yeah, so I think the definitely are opportunities out there. How about you? Great. A challenge and an opportunity for <coughs> correlations and using that approach. It is working. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, one of the big challenges when we look at seizures in, during early life is I think we have to uh, look as much at development as we do seizure control. I don't think these necessarily identical pathways, but I think it's really important when we think about what seizures are doing to the whole neural circuit, um, ways to intervene that could both improve seizures and improve um, uh, cognitive outcome is, I think, uh, paramount. And I, I don't think stopping seizures is probably enough. I think these are, whatever the etiology of the seizures is, that maybe they're doing, it, the cognitive impairment may be different from the seizures, and I think we cannot just simply treat seizures. We have to treat the child. Okay, thank you. Um, I think with the whole interest in biomarkers, not only for epilepsy, but development, you now are having earlier interventions that may impact the severity of autism. There's so many more earlier interventions and we're getting younger and younger, so it's a tremendous opportunity and I think just the explosion of genomics, there'll be a time where we will have the genetic um, mutation hopefully at birth or shortly after birth and then you have the whole evolution and development of precision medicine. Great. Any questions from the floor? I have a question. Martina, have you thought about, I realize you're in the middle of the trial, but when, do you ever envision that, for example, the children, should this be positive, would be able to get off by Gabitrin? What signs would you expect to see? Well, you, you want to move them out of that risk, the high risk window that first two years. So the commitment was that at two years, it was at the discretion of the, the principal investigator that they could taper them off, most, most certainly. Because you, and that's the whole idea. We don't know if we'll prevent it, but we may delay it, or it may be milder if we can just be on the preventative side of this. So it's not lifelong, no. And you know, I, I know there's great interest in using mTOR inhibitors, but I think that's another story because the, if you start it, how long do you treat? That's more of an open-ended question. So we started about an hour ago. Um, did you have a question, Dan? Just a, a little bit. Okay. 
So we started about an hour ago with what looked like wishful thinking, and an hour later we have a trial in which we are talking about preventive trials. So I think a, a round of applause to all the speakers for the great work. Okay, and then now we'll move to the pipeline session. Gail. So thanks to the speakers. And, and we have two more speakers left in the session. We're going to look at two new modalities for treating epilepsy. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Barry Tico. He is the chief medical officer for Stoke Therapeutics, and he's going to talk about um, oligonut... Well, I knew I wasn't going to be able to say this. Oligos. Um, for, for modifying mRNA to treat genetic epilepsies. Thanks, Gail. Thanks, Neil, for the invitation. And the, the, the panel and the preceding talks were a great introduction to my discussion, so hopefully um, the background will be there to understand a little bit more about our approach. So I'm the chief medical officer at a company called Stoke Therapeutics. We're based in the Boston area. And we have a new technology that's based on antisense oligonucleotides, which are intended to you address splicing to increase messenger RNA and protein levels inside the cell. And this is based on the fact that, as you've heard, we're starting to hear more and more about genetics of brain diseases, especially epilepsies, which I'll be focusing on. And using our treatment, we can address the underlying cause of the epilepsy. So we can actually restore or repair the, the baseline underlying mechanism of the disease. And we're focusing especially now on autosomal dominant haploinsufficiencies, which I'll explain a little bit more what that is in a moment. We are using an antisense oligonucleotide, which is very similar to Spinraza, which is a drug that some of you may have heard about. It's a drug that Biogen sells for the treatment of SMA. And our technology and mechanism of action is very similar to that. So we can use some of the learnings from that in terms of the safety and the development path to apply to our drugs as well. And based on that, we plan to have a clinical trial in Dravet syndrome starting at the beginning of next year. And I'll give you all the background on that. We also have focused on other genetic epilepsies, and we will choose another one we, we're planning on by the end of this year. We can also use our antisense oligos, which have also been used to treat diseases of the eye, of the liver, of the kidney, and so we have the potential for those types of organ diseases as well. But I'll focus right now on what we call TANGO, which is, stands for Targeted Augmentation of Nuclear Gene Output. And this is a technology that relies on the fact that in mRNA, which codes for protein, there are signals in either introns or non-coding exons which target that mRNA to be degraded or not to make protein in the cell. So a, a normal pre-mRNA, in, in some cases, on the up, upper part there, you see the intron or the non-coding exons are removed and the message then gets translated into protein. On the lower part, though, you see that when those retained introns or retained non-coding exons are present in the cell, then that cell reads those and destroys the RNA and does not make protein from it. What our technology does is shown here animated. The antisense oligonucleotide comes down and helps to excise that that signal for degradation removes that. Therefore, there's more coding, or what we call pro or productive mRNA, and that more productive mRNA can then make more protein. And in this case, we're showing a doubling of protein. We can get up to tenfold increases of protein. And this is now independent. This is not related to any mutation. These are sequences that are present in normal people. In, in the normal situation, it's a way that the cell normally uses to regulate protein production. So this is completely independent of any mutation. Therefore, we can use it to increase protein levels in diseases where the protein levels are low, but we could also use it to increase protein levels in a normal state or in a disease state that's not directly related to this gene, but we wanted to just increase the protein level 
to try to treat that disease. Some of the advantages that our technology have is, first of all, we can use it for just about any size gene, but we're especially focused on genes that are above four to four and a half KB because genes that have coding sequences that are that large cannot be used in AAV vectors that are typical for gene therapy. So we are focusing on genes where gene therapy is not a viable option. We also, uh, I didn't focus, uh, mention it, but th this, our technology will only work in cells that are already making that messenger RNA and already making that protein. So it's very tissue specific. It will only allow for expression in cells that are already seeing that protein. So it's a huge safety advantage that one does not see with, for instance, AV vectors that go into almost all cells and produce proteins in cells that don't normally see that protein. And as I'll show you in a moment, we can also titrate our, our therapy. So we have a dosage effect. So especially for instances where one doesn't want too much expression of a protein because there may be toxicity there. And we see many diseases where too little is not good, but too much is not good as well. When one wants to be very regulated about how much protein one produces, we can regulate that by limiting the amount of antisense oligo that we administer. So I'll focus now on Dravet syndrome. You've heard a little bit about it from the session from GW this morning, and Rod and a few others mentioned Dravet as well. But Dravet is caused by a mutation in the SCN1A gene, which codes for a sodium channel subunit called NAV1.1. There have been over now over 1,300 different mutations identified in this gene. So if we wanted to use a gene editing approach to try to correct each individual mutation, that would be impossible for SCN1A for, for Dravet syndrome. Uh, as you heard before, uh, currently available anti-epileptic drugs don't work very well, and in fact, 90% of Dravet patients are not controlled in terms of epilepsy. They also have, as, as you heard before, other non-epilepsy comorbidities, especially in terms of cognition and, and gait and behavior, and none of the therapies actually are, are addressed towards that. So there are no disease-modifying therapies currently available for Dravet syndrome, uh, and, and it's still a, a relatively uh, prevalent disease, so there are over 35,000 patients that are currently uh, suffering from the disease. So for our treatment, I'll just use this schematic again. We have a nonsense-mediated decay non-coding exon that's present in the SCN1A gene that we've identified. When, we, when that is present, as you see in the bottom panel, the, the cell degrades that message and no protein is made. When that non-coding exon is removed, then one has still full-length message and full-length protein is made from that. So using our antisense oligonucleotide, we come in, we splice out that non-coding exon, allow for still full-length, normal size protein to be made and increased in levels. And the evidence is that we have now in, in this case, wild-type mice. So it, for this experiment, we have a, our antisense oligonucleotide. It's relatively short, 18 nucleotides long. It, it is binding to a specific region in the mouse genome that's only present at this non-coding exon region. It happens to be the exact same sequence in humans. So this oligo here that you see is the same one that we plan to use in our clinical trials. And as you see on the left there in a wild-type mouse, when the injection is done intraventricularly at, at day two of life, one sees that the non-productive mRNA goes down in a dose-related effect, and the Productive mRNA goes up in a dose-related effect, and that's translated on the far right there in terms of NAV 1.1 protein. So we can increase in a dose-dependent manner NAV 1.1 protein. This is from whole brain extracts in these mice. And as you see, we can get up to an eight to 10-fold increase. These mice, however, were perfectly fine, even with that eight-fold increase in the NAV 1.1, didn't seem to affect them at all. Now I'll show you some data that we derived uh, with our collaboration at University of Michigan with Lori Isom and Jack Parent, who have a mouse model for Dravet syndrome that's based on a mutation that's found in humans. And you'll fo I'll focus you on the, let's see if I can point this thing here. 
the bottom. Oh, oh, point is your turn. <laughs> All right. So if you if you look here, it, this it, this is the Dravet mouse, and you see this is the NAV 1.1 level, and you see here that they have a 50 percent amount of the NAV 1.1 level compared to the wild type. When we have administered our antisense oligonucleotide here in the case at, at P2, you see that the NAV 1.1 level is restored back to normal. This was done at seven weeks, but we also checked it again at, after three months, and it persists. And we have data now that a single injection can last for almost up to six months and have this sustained effect. Here's the, the key slide here. This is the key piece of data. You see that in these, these mice, they normally, by day 30 of life, up to three, two thirds of these animals die. They have seizures and die. And that's what you see in the control group here. In the treated group here, so this is the, the purplish line here, you see that with day two of treatment here of our ASO, no mice died by day 30 and one mouse died uh, before day 90. So this to us was, was strong evidence that our treatment can potentially have an effect on the symptoms of Duray syndrome. So we have data now that we can increase NAV 1.1 levels to restore them back to normal, an effect that lasts over three months with a dramatic re more reduction in mortality. I didn't show you, but this is very selective for SCN1A. We looked at other SCNs, and there was no effect there. And I also didn't show you, but from a tolerability safety perspective, we've now done this in mice, rats, and, and monkeys, and we've seen no adverse effects at all that we've detected. So the next step is to file an IND, which we're, we're planning to do by the end of this year, and start clinical trials in children 2 to 18 years of age who have Dravet syndrome, and hopefully, even with a single injection, uh, over a 12-week period, we may see uh, an effect on their seizure levels. Finally, we do have, we have looked at many other genes that cause epilepsy. Some of them you know here, and all of the ones that are listed here are ones that we have identified, these signal sequences that are unique to each one of these genes that we could target with an antisense oligos. I'll show you, I'll highlight from Martina TSC there, uh, Rett syndrome, and uh, a few others that, that are, uh, have been mentioned at this meeting even. This is our team, this is my disclaimer, and this is my contact information. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you. So we will again have questions at the end of the session. So our next and final speaker is Dan Abrams. Dan is a neurosurgeon by training and is the CEO of Cerebral Therapeutics. And he's going to talk about yet another modality for treating seizures. Um, thank you, Gail. Thank you, Anil. What a great uh, conference and what great ideas and really exciting uh, progress that's been there. So I'm here, can you guys hear me okay? I'm here to talk today about applying um, neurosurgical methods and drug delivery um, to the brain for improvement of lives with patients with severe medically refractory epilepsy. Um, that's our focus, is we're basically bringing together neurosurgical techniques, small doses of special formulated medications to use in implantable therapies. Um, I, I'm not gonna emphasize this, I think everyone here knows that medically refractory epilepsy is a major issue. Their mortality, as you'll see in the, um, uh, in the next few slides, is quite substantial. Um, one third of epilepsy patients don't um, uh, stay refractory, and it's a major issue for them. Um, multiple drugs create multiple side effects. We talked about that earlier. It's not just the morbidity of the disease. It's the morbidity of the other medications uh, that create a major problem for them. And, um, and it's a major issue in terms of uh, the general health care. This was um, probably uh, the most compelling recent study that I've seen that really showed the difference in outcomes and survivals in the kind of patients we focus on, and that's the severe drug refractory epilepsy group. These are patients on at least um, three different, or have tried at least three different medicines, uh, often are actually on three different medicines at one time, and still have multiple seizures, not one seizure every three months, but they're having multiple seizures per month, really disabling to them. And as you can see, their survival is dramatically different, even in the 36 months after diagnosis. This is a 
a very nice study from Germany that was recently published. So um, the concepts here um, uh, that we focus on are crossing the blood-brain barrier, or as I like to frame it, neurosurgically landing on the moon. Um, there are three different ways really to cross the blood-brain barrier that people have followed over the years. One is to open tight junctions and use um, things like mannitol and osmolar agents to do that. That usually works in short term. It's hard to do that in general. Two, um, and that's the illustration of it, um, two is to um, go across the blood-brain barrier, some of the Trojan horse approaches that people have used in order to trick drugs and trick the blood-brain barrier that this is normal and come across it. And the third way is um, the surgical way and to do it bluntly and across using uh, neurosurgical techniques. And so compared to the other two, it may appear less elegant. Certainly, um, you look at some of really the cool science that you're seeing here. But neurosurgical techniques have worked for a long time. Um, we're able to help a lot of patients in different settings. And so at least our view is it's really combining the elegance of medications, bringing it together with neurosurgical techniques, applied in a very refined, specific, elegant way to really help patients. Yeah, that's the killer slide if you see right there. <laughs> so um, I, I think to this group, it's, it's well known that uh, the blood-brain barrier poses a major challenge, not to all drugs, but to many drugs in terms of crossing the blood-brain barrier. And the general rule, the bigger the drug, the harder it is to get across is there. And the diagram on the bottom really helps to illustrate those concepts. Um, I'm going to now shift a little bit to talk a little bit more like a neurosurgeon, and that is, um, so we put catheters very similar to what people put for ventricular peritoneal shunts. So <laughs> children with hydrocephalus have uh, fluid that needs to be removed from the brain and actually redirected towards the peritoneum and reabsorbed. So the pathways and the procedures for doing neurosurgical techniques like these are incredibly well established. Um, there are at least 150,000 kids in the United States walking around with shunts and these kind of tubings. And essentially we're using a similar approach for patients with epilepsy by putting an implantable plump, pump uh, lateral to the belly button. Um, you see the sort of red marks there tunneling it under the skin behind the ear, and then putting it in in a similar way to the diagram I showed you before into the lateral ventricle. And so that provides the pathway around this. Um, it's important to mention that our approach really stands on the shoulders of the pain doctors and the nurse surgeons and the physiatrists that have come before, um, uh, you really using baclofen for uh, direct administration into the spine. And that's chronic long-term, so today there are about 150,000 patients um, who have implantable pumps for uh, pain and spasticity in the United States. And they live with these, and having these medications administered chronically has transformed their lives. And really what our company's goal and what our therapy's goal is to take these principles that have been substantially effective in those areas and applying them to the major area of unmet need in medically refractory epilepsy. So um, there are a bunch of uh, implantable pumps out there. Um, uh, there are really three major ones. One is uh, the Medtronic company that really established uh, the field and their pumps have been out there really since 1988 and certainly since 1992. They're used with morphine and baclofen, as I mentioned before. There's also another drug called Prealt. And also uh, there have been some compounding of other drugs as well. But the bottom line is these are good implantable drugs. They're about the size of a hockey puck. I call it a bagel because it's sitting next to the belly and it sounds a little more appetizing. But it goes under the skin in a small incision. Um, and then you tunnel it under the skin. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the people who do building like to describe it as um, putting wiring in your basement. Just put it under the skin and then you put it in through a small hole in the cranium that's very well established um, and with very low morbidity. As I mentioned, these are done regularly. These are not done by the senior neurosurgeon. They're often done by the first year resident. And the procedures um, that are used here can be done in under two hours. We have some modifications and other things with the procedures, so they really can be done in under 30 minutes. And basically, um, the pump here that I've illustrated is the one that we're um, working with now. There are different indices and variations, but all the pumps are very good. Um, and the pump that we're using here allows for long-term administration, allows it to be filled every three months. The drug is put um, under the skin, much as a long-term port um, for oncology and is filled with 20 mils or 40 mils of drug, and then it's refilled every three months. We have some special modifications to make it very good for what we need for epilepsy. We have an occlusion detector, the MRI compatible, some things that are very key for how we're doing it. Um, but the bottom line is, is it's really bringing a pump 
together with a reformulated drug. And this is sort of my slide to talk about that um, we're not talking about really cool network stuff and we're not talking about amazing mRNA, but we are talking about bringing neurosurgical techniques into what's really mainly a medication therapy and using that to improve outcomes and their principles. It's not just the right drug and it's not just the right medicine, it's also in the right concept of disease. We put a lot of work in doing that and you'll see, I think, that uh, we're seeing some really nice results uh, with our patients. So um, we have a phase 1B uh, 2A trial undergoing in Australia. Um, we've had um, uh, five patients that we have long-term data, um, one now out almost to two, two and a half years, um, where we've seen dramatic improvement in their quality of epilepsy. The drug is administered, it's, it, as I mentioned, filled every one month to three months, and we get to see what their outcomes are. All of these patients had greater than 10 seizures per month, um, actually, one of them had up to 300 seizures per month. Um, and uh, we subselected for patients who um, had the right anatomic distribution. And um, all of the patients had substantial improvement. The only one that had less than 50% initially, uh, it was about 30%, was a patient who had um, over 250 seizures a month. Um, part of the problem when you get to very high seizure numbers is what's the baseline? How many can they actually really count um, around that? But um, it, it's really been quite dramatic. Um, three of the patients had extensive periods of being totally seizure-free. Um, the CSF levels we get on the, on the patients are much higher than with uh, serum administration, but the serum levels are really quite low, which um, isn't surprising when you think about um, administration. But the details and how we administered the drug are things that really we didn't fully expect and have been a really great result for the patients. So. Um, I was asked to speak a little bit about the regulatory pathway. So um, putting drugs with devices in patients is something that FDA has gotten really good at lately, um, but it's still something that requires a lot of effort because it involves two different divisions, both the drug division and the device division. Um, it's a long-term implantable pump. These are most among the most complex devices um, known to man today because they have chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, and electrical engineering. And then getting the right drugs in the safe way in the brain at the right level. So that's the responsibility of FDA to work with us, not only to make sure it's done safely, but then, of course, to demonstrate effectiveness and properly, proper, uh, properly um, uh, size and execute clinical trials. And so really right now what we're doing is uh, we're really gearing up. Uh, we have some really uh, great people working with us to really help get us approved with the FDA um, to open a US IND and we move rapidly towards an approval study. So um, this is a little bit about the overview of the next study design. Um, uh, we put a lot of effort into what that looks like, what's a dosing study. Uh, um, uh, we had some interesting discussions even today about how do you do a placebo trial versus a historical control at a phase two. What does that do in terms of getting you to the next step? But the bottom line is, is um, we have a specialized pump, specialized catheter, specialized drug, continuing to gather data to really um, tee us up towards an approval study. Um, these study endpoints, um, we're focused on adults, although uh, the work here that you're hearing about children is so important. Um, we think given that it's surgical, it makes sense really to stay and focus on adults. The primary endpoint is seizure outcomes. We think it's probably um, uh, median seizure frequency reduction. There's some sense about whether a binary endpoint would work that seems to be more important in Europe than in the United States. Um, but right now our key focus is on the United States. Um, we have had some really impressive differences in seizure severity. And so how we measure that is important. The patients, because they're so much better, um, we've had some really great results on their Beck depression inventory and also on their quality of life measures. So those are the pieces that we're doing. We'll narrow these, of course, because it's uh, an extensive list. But these are the ones that we're looking at as we expand to our next study. Um, and really, this is really just the concepts of building the business to take it to a pivotal and really be able to show that. So we're very excited. We have great partners. Um, we really now have a phenomenal team to be able to do this and some really promising data to help patients, again, with uh, focal adult um, patients uh, with focal adult medically refractory epilepsy. Thank you very much for your time and for putting up with a neurosurgeon. <laughs>
Uh, are you doing? We're getting to. Uh, yeah. Um, so I'm going to dissect your question just a little bit right, to be a little absolutely. more. So um, th I think there were two parts. One was, um, what do the pharmacokinetics yeah. look like? And I think you were looking for a little more detail around it. So yeah. we have cerebrospinal fluid levels in the ventricle um, uh, where the medication is administered. So cerebrospinal fluid levels in the spine wouldn't cut it no, right. uh, because they're not focal. Um, the levels that we're seeing are somewhere between 10 and even higher times what you would see with oral administration. Um, in fact, we've had some that are um, 20 to 30 times. One of the things that's kind of am amazing is the serum levels are much lower. And we're using it in the ventricular fluid. So if you think about it, it surrounds the hippocampus, um, which is really uh, mission-centric for a lot of epilepsies. So we really focused on patients where the um, distribution in the hippocampi would be very important. So most of these drugs are, are PGP substrates. And I wondered how, you know, what what the levels look like in terms of their uh, pharmacokinetic profile. Yeah, so the, um, the, so th as you know, the PGP substrates are located on the endothelial side, right, right which is not really where we're putting the medication. Okay, so so it's on the other side. Um, we haven't seen um, some of the things that you would look like um, adjustment, lowering the level, the mm -hmm. whole um, medically refractory theory around that uh, doesn't appear to be a major issue for us. The issue, the levels are sustainable, long-term, higher. Um, we have good toxicology data where we've looked at periventricular edema and those kinds of things. No evidence of that. In addition to clinically, just doing awesomely. Um, when you look also from an imaging um, non-invasive modality, all of those things look quite good. And did you choose valproic acid because of the solubility characteristics? Well, actually, the reported solubility on it weren't high enough to get there. So um, we had some formulation work we had to do behind it. Um, there were a number of factors. Um, we actually have a whole profile for how do you approach this. We have a whole bunch of other drugs to look at. But it turned out our first one was spot on. And so we're continuing on, on our next steps with it. But uh, some of it is empiric, right? So we had a strategy. You go to one and two and three, it just turned out valproic acid worked. So um, that is one of the considerations, but it wasn't the only one okay. or the major one. Mm -hmm. okay. Bill's question it just made me think of something else. Uh, That's okay. I didn't know what you were going to ask before. <laughs> right. The valproic acid, w would that all be free valproic acid because it's in the CNS? So you'd much, you would not need as high a dose, well, way lower dose. I think you were talking about a level of 10 which is very low for valproate, so. Yeah, um, so I think, I, um, so I'm gonna reposition your question, um, uh, okay. even though I'm gonna take a little liberties here with that. So um, uh, what I think you're asking is, is in the serum it's so tightly bound, right. how does that play in the brain? So we know in most settings that the cerebrospinal fluid albumin level is tiny way below 1% of what it is. And so it's three grams per deciliter, three and a half grams per deciliter. In the serum, it's way below 1%, even in cases of like multiple sclerosis or other things where there's aberration in the blood bearing barrier. So all of ours is essentially unbound. And so um, the relationship between bound and unbound and systemic and central is very key. What's probably the more important way to think about this is if you're taking a medication and you want to deliver it to the eye and you want to put very high levels in the eye, you'll see some systemically, but you're actually getting it right at the site of action. And so I think sometimes people, in order to understand the concept, the first key is you're getting it there without the interference and you're also getting, I don't, I have a really nice diagram about this, but it's constant administration. So remember, it's not just the level and just the amount, when you give, as I like to call, oral medications, intermittent oral bolusing, you don't have any inter intermittent oral bolusing, right? The pumps are pumping it out just like an IV nurse there all the time. So it's high local amounts around it. Um, the normal CSF levels are somewhere around one-tenth of what we're seeing. So we have the equivalent of somewhere around a 400-fold dose advantage because we're not only lowering the systemic, we're giving it centrally, but the central level is higher than you could get with the oral. Does that make sense? Yes, very much so, that's exciting. Um, now I'll get to my real question. Go for <laughs> and it. If, and you may have covered it, and forgive me if I missed it. Um, mm -hmm. The rate infection or uh, hemorrhage with the procedure. Right, um, so uh, we've had zero, um, uh, zero hemorrhages at all, and you'd really expect that with, um, with you know, 
people are really very good with catheters today, neurosurgeons, especially when you use neuroimaging. Um, so we'd expect the rate of hemorrhage at all to be similar to deep brain stimulation that's used for Parkinson's disease that are on the order of about one in a thousand, something like that. But even when that, it's sort of a dot on the CT scan, the number of fatal hemorrhages related to it is under one in 10,000. These patients that I was mentioning are, have a huge rate of SUDEP. Um, that's a rate of about a half a percent per year of sudden death related to epilepsy, far dwarfing the risk of hemorrhage or the other part. Um, we have had a few infections in the beginning because we had hardware stuff to work out. How many catheters, how do they work, when are they placed? Um, we essentially have a way of addressing that and that also has to do with surgical time. We expect the infection rate in the end to be under 5%, probably under 3%. And when you look at the publications for deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease, they're about 11%. So that, that, that's part of systemization and normalization of everything neurosurgical. Or the simple way to think of it is Harvey Cushing, when he did his brain surgeries for tumors, he had a 70% mortality rate related to infection for the first 10 years. They didn't have antibiotics and that kind of stuff. But he got it down to 3 to 4%. Our targets are really in that range. Great. Thanks very much. That's a statistic that you don't hear every day. I'm going to remember that one. I, I have a question for Barry. You said something that was very interesting. Um, you didn't find an upper limit. You didn't find AEs related to increased um, NAV 1.1. Can you explain that? Do you have a theory? Well, it's we, we don't we haven't done full investigations of that, but it's likely due to the fact that the NAV 1.1 is part of a sodium channel where there are other components. And if those components are, are rate limiting, then even having excess 1.1 around would unlikely cause new channels or any effect on the available channels. It's also known that the NAV 1.1 actually exists in a subcellular pool. So there actually already exists a pool of NAV 1.1, and we're just adding to that pool, and then the cell just pulls it out when it needs it. So normally at this point, we'd say the session is adjourned, but based on what I've heard today, I think the adventure is just beginning. So thank you for hanging around and come back next year. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Great to meet you. I bet you know each other from when you were in the accident. I bet just the basics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you ever go to the, um, go to the